I was just very struck by the phrase you used, Ahmed, first of all. You talked kind of disdainfully about parachute journalism. Now, journalists parachute in at the moment as war correspondents from place to place, some of the most famous war correspondents in the world because they're trying to make sense of things. Are you saying in the end that that, that kind of parachute journalism and, and Yevgeny was just saying, you know, it's not cheap. You send people all over the world for the independent. That won't happen anymore. You know, to be honest, I think it would be presumptuous of me to determine whether or not that will be happening. But in my uh, perspective, I think there is much more value added in relying on people who already live there because they're already invested in these stories. And even if they're not professional journalists, there are, uh, there are people who have insights and anecdotes, and they're a valuable part of, I think, the news gathering process. That's not to say that parachute journalism or, journal or foreign correspondents um, will not exist or should not exist, certainly. And I didn't necessarily mean to be disdainful, though I see how I could have been. Um, I was only joking about the disdainful. No, OK. Well, I was joking about not meaning it. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. The, the, the reality is, I mean, it's expensive. It is expensive. And, yeah. and, and this is, you know, everybody is, you know, Everybody's cutting back. You know, the broadcasters are cutting back. The main uh, newspapers are cutting back. But if you, for example, I mean, I think Storyfy is a really interesting prospect because actually there is no mediation in this. You could put together a story that is completely bonkers. And as we'll hear from Paul Conroy, the verification of a lot of videos of stuff coming out of all the different uh, um, revolutions that mm -hmm. have taken place is difficult sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, when you're saying that suddenly you can put out overnight, you're kind of parachuting from your hotel bedroom, aren't you? I am. You are. So basically, you can put out to all your Twitter followers something that actually could be complete bollocks. It's true, it's true. The, the reality is uh, verification is challenging because there are no methods, there's no style book, as so we I have said. To, we, that's what we, this conference is really about. How do you curate without being authoritarian? That's a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a good construct. I mean, I wish I had all the answers. I certainly don't. Um, but I think, you know, one quick anecdote, if I can, is, you know, during the Egyptian uh, revolution, there was uh, essentially a situation where the, there were rumors and tweets that started spreading and retweets that the Israeli embassy uh, had had military helicopters come in and literally airlift the staff away uh, to safety amidst all this violence when the Egyptian people themselves weren't safe. So I saw this and it started you know, trending and so on and so forth on Twitter and then cross-posting onto Facebook and perhaps Google Plus. Um, but, but, Say it quickly. Yeah, but the point is, you know, within a matter of 25 minutes, there are ways of corroborating mm -hmm. these things. Whether, for example, I knew that the Israeli embassy was in a certain location mm -hmm. and I have either friends on the ground or even, even reporters who are parachuting in who you can rely on. I mean, nothing should exist in a vacuum. There is a symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. between the mainstream media and conventional reporting and social media. And Yours, just coming back to what you were saying, in a sense, you're curating. You want to have what you called... Uh, a kind of brain food supermarket, but isn't the danger you're going to fry people's brains because you're going to put so much stuff on there? Isn't the danger that actually we don't have time to do all this? We need people to edit, not editorialize, but to curate properly. Yeah, and that's your personal shopper. You're the personal shopper yeah, for you're, them. Yeah. So you're. So in this case, you say so. So you don't know anything about the Arab Spring. So where do you want to start? And so you, do you, would you like to watch some video or have a, a podcast or do you like print? And do you have 10 minutes or half an hour? Do you want to see what other people liked uh, or found very useful? And so, you, you, yeah, it's, it's sort of like a department. The way you would go to a restaurant and the chef would say, um, are you new here or do you know the menu already? You just want to know the specials. If you have uh, The Guardian as a traditional newspaper funded by a trust, you know, which presumably doesn't have deep, deep pockets, and you've got a Guardian Online doing very well. Where, where, if you're, where if you're under 30, do you go first? And maybe you just stay online, you don't go to the paper. Maybe that's what is going to happen. I think so, yeah. Well, well generally, I think uh, quality papers have always appealed to a subset of the population. And so we've, I think that there's now this scramble of sort of getting in as much as you can. And we just should just accept that uh, most people just want to want to have an emotion while they watch the news. But there's also a group of people who want to have thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I think quality newspapers are about that segment of the population. So that means a cool and distant perspective, and always keep uh, keep sort of the the activism and the idealism at a remove, because you may be taken for a ride. You may be taken for a ride. We'll be talking to Paul about that. But we've got a question here from the audience. Um, so there's something called the identifiable victim effect. If you remember, there was a story in the US many years ago in which baby Jessica fell to a well 
<clears throat> and she was stuck there for 40 some hours. And she had more CNN coverage in Rwanda and Darfur put together. And I think the newspapers have the, the saying, if it uh, bleeds, it leads. And I'm wondering whether as we move to more online media, whether there will be more things that are sensational, uh, accuracy is a separate issue, but more emphasis toward things that could fit in 140 characters, or one th more things that can fit in one picture, more things that are appeal to the emotion rather than things that help us understand something in a higher depth. If I may, I would disagree. Uh, the reason I would disagree is because, you know, social media and Twitter, even as concise as it is, I think only helps us get to the bottom of a matter, whatever the matter might be. And I, I agree with you, CNN, Baby Jessica, I mean, a lot of mainstream media tends to either, you know, cave into advertising interests or perhaps what they presume the public might want to know about, something that is sensational, something that is fantastic. And a lot of stories get lost, but social media also, I think, really allows people to publish what they view as to be the most important things. And it's a, it's a, it's a scramble, I think, is the word that was used, but... It's, uh, it's really a reflection, I think, of the human condition. And I, 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 I can never imagine or accept the premise that allowing more people into the fold and more voices from all over the world, whether it's Israel, whether it's Uganda, whether it's uh, Palestine, is a bad thing. Yours. Uh, yeah, but there's, there's a huge risk of being swamped. Mm. And uh, I think that the, it's, it's very tempting to mistake the authenticity of your own emotion for uh, good professional work. And just because you feel very strongly about something, I think it's, um, it's to, co to call out uh, propaganda and to sort of, if you take the sort of the Middle East uh, conflict, uh, you have about six different camps. And each, each camp sort of thinks of itself as the good guy. And I think good professional work would be to explain how the world looks from those six different Venues. This is something that mainstream media don't do at the moment. Mm -hmm. They just follow the discourse of one of the camps and then explain the entire situation from that perspective. Uh, but I think that would be very good work. So I'm, I'm not very much with the old media, but I, th I worry about the, the sort of breathlessness of the new media. And don't throw the old methods out of the window because they're, they're actually, they're honed over time. They're really valuable. Well, we're going to have to be a bit breathless now because uh, we're going to move on to our final guest. But again, could you please thank Yoris and Ahmed? <laughs>